The SNK boss syndrome refers to the infamously high difficulty of SNK fighting game bosses. With K-Wave being their flagship title, this series certainly had its share of unforgettable hair-pulling antagonists who are about to be listed according to how much traumatic memories they gave us. In this list, we're putting aside the lore behind these characters and we're going to base their order solely on how difficult they are from a pure gameplay perspective. Also, we're not including any mid or sub bosses as they will have their own list in a future video. So without further ado, here's the top 10 toughest bosses in the KUF series. Considering all the build-up to its first appearance in K-Wave 97, Orochi was surely a letdown, especially compared to the bosses of the previous installments who were supposed to have only a fragment of its power, yet managed to be much harder to deal with than the legendary being itself. And it's not the lack of powerful moves and devastating super attacks that condemned Orochi to the 10th position of this list. In fact, Orochi has one of the best projectiles in the entire series, and its light based desperate move deals tons of damage even when blocked. However, the problem with Orochi is its AI. Unlike other SNK bosses, it's surprisingly passive and predictable. All one has to do is run and roll. It's almost guaranteed that Orochi will throw a projectile or an energy pillar which will give anybody enough time to punish it. Many think that the mid boss Wild Iori was tougher than the final boss, and I can hardly argue with that. The second main boss of the Nest Saga, Clone Zero, is one of the higher ranked agents of the criminal cartel who decided to go rogue and betray his organization for his own personal agenda. He is also the one responsible of Chrysalis' death at the end of K-Wave 99. During the fight, he relies mainly on his special suit which has blades sewn into the lining. He also has mastery over a type of power called Dark Energy which allows him to use some unique and dreadful techniques such as immobilizing the opponent with his own shadow and even forming a black hole. Clone Zero or Zero One as he was nicknamed can be a real pain to defeat, that is if the player doesn't know how to exploit his AI. His uppercuts are easy to bait, which renders him open to all sorts of punishments from the player. I do like his design though, he is the least anime-like boss in this list. The most recent entry of this list, Verse, is certainly not the most liked boss by the fans, mainly because of its design that is more suited for a JRPG master rather than a fighting game character. But this list is about how difficult the bosses are, and Verse is not very tough either, at least not in a medium difficulty. This dark entity has the power of pyrokinesis which enables it to control fire and summon a barrage of flaming fists. Verse can also fly and use its teleporting ability to surprise its enemy from behind. There are no AI exploits for this boss to my knowledge and as mentioned earlier can be a very tough opponent in the higher difficulties but remains fairly manageable. The good thing about Verse, once it was defeated, the souls of many previous dead characters were freed and came back to life, hinting their potential return in KOF 15, and just for that we can at least be grateful for the presence of Verse in the series. When Ash Crimson betrayed his ancestor and absorbed his soul at the end of K-Wave 13, he didn't expect his plan to backfire so quickly when Psyche took over his body and transformed him into Dark Ash, aka one of the cheapest bosses made by SNK in recent years. Sure, he is not the most intimidating when it comes to his look. I mean, it's just Ash Crimson with a dark aura surrounding him, but all his attacks were immensely buffed by his newly acquired black flames. In addition to his super annoying fiery projectiles, he leaves a trail of dark flames while moving, which damages his opponent. His punches and kicks are infused by the said flames for increased damage, and much like Shizuru, Dark Ash can seal his enemy's techniques for a short period of time. Time. The first time I fought him, I was immensely frustrated by how cheap and annoying his fireballs are. I just couldn't beat him and ended up abandoning the match. Then I discovered later that Dark Ash is just one of these cheap bosses with stupid AI. Sweeps are lethal against him because apparently he forgot how to block low when he gained his new powers. 
In order to fight the true boss of KOF 2003, the player has to defeat the mid-boss Kusanagi with a disparate move. Only then he can face Mukai at the game's conclusion instead of Adelheid. Unlike his master, Mukai has a much more intimidating presence as he is well over 2 meters high and exceeds 150 kilograms of weight. He is harder to defeat as well. This hulking figure excels in both close and long range combat and has the power of the earth element allowing him to create rocks out of nowhere, transforming his body into stone and petrifying his enemies for a duration by simply touching them or firing a blast of grey energy at them. Although this formidable being is a member of those from the past, Mukai never underestimates his opponents even if they are mere humans. He respects their power and is well aware of their potential, a unique trait that not many of his brethren share with him. Despite how wicked and ill-intentioned the KOF bosses are, none of them can compete with Genets in terms of pure evil. This man did more harm to many characters than the entire cast of bosses combined, including Orochi, the being who Genets worships. As the leader of the Hakishu and a member of the Heavenly Kings, Genitz has the power of Aerokinesis. He can control the air and wind currents at will, create hurricanes and tornadoes out of nowhere, attack his enemies with blades made of air, translocate by transporting his molecules through the air, execute supers without meter and even fly, because of course he can. In addition of that, he can give Orochi powers to humans as he did with Rugal and can activate the right of the blood in those who have part Orochi blood like Leona and Iori. His iconic move Yonokaze is a tornado that comes up at random, slicing any foe it touches. He always uses this move while mocking his opponent by saying his catchphrase Kokodeska or is it there? He also has one of the best stages in the series. While he doesn't have any known weaknesses, his AI is completely clueless against Chin. Apparently, Genets never learned how to deal with the drunken fist style. Designed to be the ultimate Kyo clone, Chrysalid is an extremely powerful product of Nets, and he knows it. His arrogance is surpassed only by his blind loyalty to the criminal syndicate. His mission was to gather battle data from the participants of KOF 99 and use it to activate the army of Kyo clones. And for that purpose, he was given a special battle suit that Chrysalid uses it during the first march against him. However, once defeated, he exhibits his true capabilities and the real combat starts. Thanks to Kyo's DNA, Chrysalid can create and manipulate fire as well, and much like the Kusanagi air, he can put his body on fire and create explosions around his opponent. But Chrysalid has more than pyrokinesis under his sleeve. His catching wind projectile is ridiculously strong. His uppercut has a large hitbox and is somewhat inevitable. Although he doesn't have the smartest AI, Chrysalid was and still is a formidable challenge and will deserve in the fourth position of this list. The third place of this list is reserved for the third member of those from the past. Magaki is undeniably one of the most irritating bosses made by SNK. Period. He organized K-Wave 11 with Shion to gather enough energy for the sake of awakening Orochi and using its power for his master, Saiki. He has no respect for humans and considered them as insects. At the end of the tournament, Magaki dropped his human envelope and transformed into his creepy and sizzling awakened form. While in this state, he relies mainly on his different types of projectiles. Magaki can create several small explosions of energy in front of him that acts as a shield and as a reflector. He has the ability to teleport, become invisible and create portals to other dimensions. His most annoying technique is without the shadow of a doubt the infamous teleporting projectile. Magaki can create projectiles that teleport themselves usually behind his opponent and caught the player off guard and he loves spamming this technique. Because of this, Magaki is the embodiment of the SNK boss syndrome. 
Now, here's a boss that haunts the nightmares of many KOF players to this day, myself included. The big boss of the NES saga, Ignis, is considered by many as the hardest boss of the entire KOF series. And although I slightly disagree with them, I perfectly understand where they're coming from. Like all the bosses of the NES saga, Ignis relies heavily on his special suit when he fights, and he is telepathically linked to it, which further increases its potential. Its capabilities include include creating force fields that act as shields, reflecting projectiles, attacking with tentacles, gathering energy from the universe and allowing its master to fly. His suit has also great resistance that is proven to be stronger than a full power diamond and maxima combined and is capable of sending them flying several meters away in a single sweep. But that's not all what Ignis is capable of, he does have his own powers. In addition of telepathy, Ignis have control over a mysterious white energy that allows him to fire projectiles and create pillars and blasts of the said energy. In brief, calling Ignis cheap would be a huge understatement. If you're still watching this video, then you may have already guessed who's the number one might be. Of course, it's none other than Rugal Bernstein, but it's crucial to specify which game we're talking about. Because you see, even though Rugal is always a difficult challenge to overcome, his title as the hardest boss ever can only go to one iteration, KOF 2002 Unlimited Match. So let me explain why Rugal in that game is the toughest opponent in the KOF series. First, you have to earn the fight against him. Being a secret boss, Omega Rugal's fight can only be unlocked if the player doesn't lose more than two rounds during the entire playthrough. This includes the Ness boss. Only then you got to experience what the word despair means. You know you're screwed when even the game is not expecting you to win and just asks you to do your best instead. In addition of the cheap characteristics that all SNK bosses have, like the insane damage output and the incredibly high resistance, Rugal's infamous genocide cutter has an extra move now that makes it extremely hard to punish. His Kaiser wave can be either super fast or delayed, rendering it impossible to predict, and he has a new move where he quickly moves forward and hits you with a barrage of kicks. This attack can be followed either by a super or a genocide cutter, which, guess what, can also be followed by a second genocide cutter. Rugal was like, you hated my genocide cutter before? How about I put a genocide cutter in my genocide cutter? But all these techniques, no matter how cheap and overpowered they are, are not what make Rugal the toughest. Say what you want about how hard the other bosses are, you always have the possibility to retry the fight against them, and you will eventually manage to beat them, either by getting good at learning their patterns, or using one of the helps offered by the game, if you have no pride like me. Same thing cannot be said about Rugal, because, take this, there are no continues. That's right, you only have one shot against Omega Rugal. Lose and it's game over, back to square one. For all these reasons, Omega Rugal in KOF 2002 Unlimited Match is the toughest boss in the entire KOF series. What? You may still disagree with me about the order of this list, in which case, I'd like to know who are the bosses who gave you a hard time and made you pull your hair the most. I hope you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up if you did, and why not consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.